Glory to Jesus Christ. Come after me. Come follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And the disciples leave everything and follow Jesus. What an amazing invitation that was extended to them. Luke's gospel tells us that this was not the first time that Jesus had invited the disciples to follow him and to become fishers of men. So as amazing as it is, it wasn't immediate. They had to get to know Jesus. They had spent some time with him before. Read it in Luke chapter 5 if you want to see the details. He, Jesus enabled the disciples to make a huge catch of fish that they needed two boats to fill. At that occasion, he gave them the same invitation that we hear him give to the disciples today. Follow me, come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they do follow him. Because he's given them a project for their life. He's given them the plan for their existence. What more wonderful project could you possibly have than go and fish for people? Go and fish and draw people into the kingdom of God. Go give them the invitation to good news and to new life. And finally, they're able to trust Jesus and leave behind the affairs of their businesses. They know that they can trust God to take care of their lives and they follow him. They follow his call to become fishers of men. And that same call is addressed to each one of us as baptized Christians to go and become fishers. Fishers of souls, fishers of men, fishers of women, fishers of children, whoever they are, attract them to the good news of Jesus Christ and draw them in to get to know him. Draw them in to the church so that they too can receive the good news and can receive the sacraments that he gives to us. Now, I don't know an awful lot about fishing, but from what I've observed, I think it can take a great deal of patience. We too may need to have a great deal of patience as we seek to draw somebody to get to know God. Also, I know for sure you need something attractive if you're going to catch the fish, if you're going to tempt, as it were, the fish to come to your hook or to come to your net. You need something attractive. You need something to draw them. And how much more do we need something attractive? Do we need good news if we're attempting to draw people to Jesus Christ? I think that very often God's plan for us as fishers of men is that we are what's meant to be that attractive thing. We are meant to have some attractive quality about our life that draws others to us that draws others to want to ask about our faith. And indeed, Peter in his first letter says, always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that is in you with gentleness and respect. But in knowing God, in knowing Jesus Christ, you have something that everybody else does not. You have something that unbelievers do not have. And maybe they will see it as hope that you have, that they don't. Maybe they will see it as a joy that you have, or as faith and confidence that you have. But always be ready to give an answer when they ask, what is it that is different about you? You know, Jesus told us that we are the salt of the earth. Salt is something that adds flavor, that adds taste to food. That's another way in which I think the gospel tells us we're meant to be attractive. We're meant to be tasty, so to speak, if you want to put it like that. And Paul says, let your speech be gracious as though seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer each one. He speaks 
and says that he prays that we may all know what is the hope of God's calling and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe. If we lived in really knowing the hope to which we called, if we really knew the exceeding greatness of God's power towards us, our lives would be incredibly attractive to those who do not know God. And I think of lots of people who in their own gifts and their own graces have attracted me to God. I have a wonderful friend called Marcy who's a chaplain in the hospital. And she has a presence and a kindness and a goodness and such an easy person to relate to, a relatability that draws all kinds of people to want to get to know better the God that she serves. God uses our gifts and the gifts of others to draw people closer to him. And when I think about God using someone to be a fisher of souls, I can't help think about my crazy Italian teacher in my first year of college. And her name was Maria, and she was very loud and very extrovert, and uh, she was... um, quite open about the fact that she did not have a lot of time for the Catholic Church. And she had some very strong opinions on abortion. But when she found out that I was going to be a seminarian, she got very excited and told me about the Pope that she loved. And this was John Paul I. And she would say, he was such a wonderful man. He was such a wonderful man. Such a beautiful smile. He came out and he smiled and everybody loved him. And he did indeed have a wonderful, glorious smile. So as best as my printer could do it justice, here is the short-lived Pope John Paul I. His name was Albino Luciani. And it was as if he appeared just for a short time. He only reigned for 33 days before he suddenly died. But he came on the balcony and he smiled and people loved him. And remember in the days before John Paul I, uh, John Paul II, when the Pope would travel all over the world doing meets and greets. Paul VI, the Pope who had reigned before him, was seen as quite a cerebral, detached person. And then all of a sudden here is this kind, joyful humble Pope with a wonderful smile all over his face. And it's, it's easy for us to forget, to underestimate the impact that he had on people at that time. You know, I really don't think the Vatican altar service was supposed to go and sit on the Holy Father's knee during the service while he has a conversation with them. But that was the kind of, the, of guy that he was. He caused them conniptions in the Vatican Department of State because he would wander into Rome. He was the head of a sovereign country wandering around Rome talking to people. He went and talked to the gardeners. He, went to, he would talk to anybody. And he was very friendly. And he exuded humility and goodness. And as Maria said, he was such a wonderful man. And it was well known that when Pope John, uh, John XXIII gave him a special bishop's cross made out of solid gold, he went and sold it and gave the money to an orphanage. People loved this guy. And they called him the smile of God, the smiling Pope. He was in Sorriso di Dio because his smile incarnated something of the goodness and the love and the kindness and the relatability of God. And certainly for my Italian teacher, God had hooked her in some way through the ministry and through the witness of this wonderful, kind, good Pope who for for whatever reasons best known to God only lived for 33 days. Interestingly enough, Pope John Paul I, a venerable, is being beatified in September, on September the 4th this year. And so I managed to find a copy of his one and only book and gave it to my Italian teacher. And I pray that one day she reads it. Now I think, knowing Maria, that if... Uh, at the end of her life, whether that has already happened, I do not know, or whether that will happen in the future. I think if Jesus Christ came 
to see her at that point, she might not receive him very well. But I've no doubt whatsoever that if Papa Luciani came along to receive her, she'd be smiling all over her face and I have this, this picture of them sitting in the sunshine, eating lunch in Rome, both of them laughing their heads off. So who knows? God is the fisher of souls. Maybe he will use uh, Pope John Paul I when the time comes to reel her soul into the kingdom. Please God. You know, he, John Paul II said... It seems to us that only yesterday he emerged from the conclave to put on the papal robes, not a light weight. But what warmth of charity, nay, what an abundant outpouring of love came forth from him in the few days of his ministry. And Mother Teresa said of him, he has been the greatest gift of God, a sunbeam of God's love, shining in the darkness of the world. God wants to use the graces that he has given to us, the graces that he's given to me, and the graces he's given to you to draw and attract and draw people in so that they can find out about his love for them. That is what God wants. He wants them to know the love that they are loved with. He wants them to know the love of the Father. St. Clement of Alexandria says that holy fish caught up from the depths of the sea out of the world's tumultuous sea of sin are enticed into your embrace, O Lord, forever to be held therein. We're enticed into God's embrace. That's what he wants. That's why he wants to draw people so he can hold them into his embrace <clears throat> and hold them forever. So whatever your gifts and graces are, your gift is probably not to be a pope, but your gift and grace is to be exactly what God has called you to be in the place that God has called you to be. Whether it's a supermarket, a law office, a school, a hospital, or as a retired person, Use your gifts and graces to attract people for Jesus Christ. Use your gifts and graces to fish for men and to fish for souls. And above all, let the gospel that you preach be good news, as it certainly was for Pope John Paul I. Don't let it be a message of condemnation or of hell like people you see on the street corners. I saw one once and he's like, you're all going to hell. Look at that lady over there with her shopping. She's going to hell. Look, you, sir, if you ignore me, you're going to hell. Everybody was going to hell. The gospel is meant to be good news. Let your gospel be good news. You know, the best thing I ever heard about evangelism, I found it on a missionary calendar. And it was a quote that had somehow made it there from an Asian synod of bishops. But it was perfect because it said, we consider our faith as our greatest treasure and therefore we want to share it with all whilst fully respecting their religious beliefs and their freedoms all christians have the duty to proclaim christ the urge to do this springs from the joy of having found a treasure and the desire of sharing it that is how you share your faith if you have a treasure and you know what a treasure you have isn't it wonderful to be able to share that treasure with the people in your life? So be generous. Share the treasure. Share the hope that you know and that they don't. Share the joy and the love that you know and that they don't. And entice fish into the embrace of Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ. Amen.